go ahead and get started. So thank you everyone for spending one of your most precious resources with me, and that is time. I know there's a ton of workshops, ton of free webinars out there, and I feel really honored that you took the time to join live today or spend time on your own watching the replay. So my goal is that by the end of this presentation, you walk away with some concrete uh, tasks that you can do to help make good habits and break the bad ones. So we will get right into it. So to get started, one thing that I wanted to start with today is just talking about the layers of behavior change, because I think that's so important when it comes to habits, making them and breaking them. So we'll talk a little bit about how we change. And then we'll also talk about four ways to make and four ways to break habits. And then we will wrap up today with a Q&A as well. And I have built in some pauses today. So that way you have some time just to maybe reflect and choose, you know, what habits you want to work on. Because essentially I wanted this to be as much workshoppy as we could, even though it is a virtual environment. But hopefully there are some well-timed pauses where you just have some time to reflect. So if you have a pen and paper handy, awesome. We will um, definitely be using that. So if you have a pen and paper, have that by you, that will help just kind of help you map out some of the things in your brain and maybe have notes that you can look back on and reference as needed. So to begin, a little bit about me. So if you don't know, my name is Kayla Gergen. I am a registered dietitian. And since I have completed school and my undergrad internship, all I know is weight management. And I love working with women in this space, especially. And when when I got into weight management, one thing that really drew me to it was just that combination of maybe just like all of misinformation out there. We've been told so many things over the years and, and recommend, recommendations, unfortunately, change, which leaves a lot of confusion. And then on top of that, mindset is such a key piece. And some of this mental component, um, which I incorporate in the LIFE program. So back in October, I actually left my clinical job. I worked at a weight loss or a weight management clinic that worked both with surgical patients, so women and men who were working towards BSG, and then also did some like medical weight management too. But my heart lies with you ladies who have uh, had weight loss surgery or pursuing it. And the reason being is, is I think weight management alone is just, again, like lots of misinformation. There's a lot of do this, do, don't do that. And we become so wrapped up in food rules. And that is even more so true in the surgery space that I just want to help break things down for you, give you information. So that way you can find out what works best for you, because what works for one person doesn't always work for another and you got to find out what works for you. And, and again, it's, it's not one size fits all. And unfortunately, some recommendations out there aren't the greatest. So I do like to debunk some of those things as well. But I do have uh, my online coaching. So that's with Life, the little uh, brand you can see here. And the life is lose it forever. And obviously, one of my big goals is to help women lose weight but more so that mental baggage that we tend to carry when it comes to weight management, body image, self-esteem. So the combination of nutrition and mindset come together to make life. And all of that is wrapped up in my online coaching program. So if you want a little bit more about that, you can always message me or drop questions in the chat box too. But when I'm not working on, working on my business, I love, love, love the outdoors. So there's a picture at the top here. That's me and my wonderful husband, Jeremy. We love hiking and backpacking and paddleboarding, really anything outdoors. Nature is where I like to recharge in just that nice, quiet, peaceful environment. I could watch all the critters all day. But my favorite little critters are these little guys down at the bottom. So if you follow me on social media, there's a good chance that uh, you have probably, you're probably familiar with 
with Molly and Beaker. So you might see little Beaker burritos every now and then on my Instagram stories. But that is a little bit about me. And before we get into that, um, I did want to talk more so about where today's inspiration came from. And for anyone who has read Atomic Habits, this presentation is just going to be a really broad overview of some of the strategies that James Clear breaks down in the book. And what you'll notice, again, broad overview, if you feel like you walk away from today and you want more, or maybe you want to dive a little bit deeper into this topic, highly, highly recommend this book. James Clear is an excellent writer. He's very clear and concise and just a ton of good things. You could read this book 10 times and bring something out every every time. <laughs> My husband and I both just recently read it. So we highlighted in like two different colors. So this book gets used a lot at our house, but we will again, do a very broad overview of this. And I will be sure when I send out the replay to include a link to this book, if you do want further reading. But to begin, we'll talk about the layers of behavior change, because I think it's important to have a basis for where maybe our motivation or some of that change stems from. And you'll see this like bullet, or excuse me, this bullseye on the left hand screen. And where we tend to really uh, focus tends to be that outcome space. So outcomes are what we want to achieve. So for example, if you're here, maybe that outcome is just wanting to lose weight, for example. And really the goal is to shift more from that outcome that I want to the identity. So really the identity, when we start to change that, that is our views of the world, our views of ourselves, our values. And really that's where the most empowerment comes from. So if you're looking at the behavior change from that identity perspective, think about statements that start with I am. So maybe I am a person that values my health. So I am going to do X, Y, and Z versus when we look at outcomes solely, it's I want to lose weight. There's not as much meat behind it. And when you, again, talk from that identity perspective or the I am or I value, that is going to take you so much farther than just simply looking at outcomes. And then the processes, that is going to be some of your systems and your habits, which we'll be talking a little bit more today. So to summarize, really the goal is to kind of step away from thinking about those outcome layers of behavior change and shifting more towards that identity. So one example that uh, James Clear uses in the book, for example, is maybe your goal is to read more. And if your goal is to read more, maybe that outcome looks like I want to read this book or I want to read more versus identity would be I am an avid reader that again has a lot more power behind it than just simply the outcomes based. So hopefully that helps a little bit on the background, but when it comes to what exactly is a habit. So I think we all tend to think it's just like that automatic behavior, things that we don't even think about. It's an automatic response and it's a reflex. Really, we give it little to no thought at all. And some research actually shows that 40 to 50% of our actions are out of habit. So imagine we go through half our day or half of our life on autopilot. That's a lot. That is a lot. And I would argue that maybe on certain days, like certain days of the week, like work day versus a weekend day, for example, that that number is probably higher. So for example, if you think of like a weekday, you're probably getting up, you're showering, driving to work, doing the, the usual routine. Whereas weekends, we have less of that structure, less of the habitual movement. So Again, I would, I would think that those numbers are a little bit higher on days where we have a little bit more structure, but just think about that 50% going through autopilot. <laughs> uh, let's see. So habit loop. So it's important to understand as we go through the conversation today, the anatomy of a habit and really the inner workings of them. So when you look at the habit loop here, Reward is central to anything that happens in the habit loop. 
So for example, the Q, that's really where everything starts. So the Q is like that little light bulb that goes off that reminds you of the reward. The craving uh, obviously is fueled by the craving for that reward. And the response is really where we can intervene the most. So the top portion of this quadrant, the Q and the craving, those are going to be a little bit more automatic and where we can really intervene and make changes is that bottom half of the quadrant. So the response more so, and then of course the reward. And one thing I wanted to expand on here too is that sometimes reward, sometimes that's just a change of state or a change of emotion. So one thing I wanted to bring up here is when we think about like habitual eating or maybe emotional eating, that we can place into this habit loop, for example. So if you think of one common thing for a lot of women is that cue is maybe getting home from work. So maybe that cue is you walk in the door and you're craving that reward, just maybe of relaxation, of relief. You made it through the day. The kids are where they need to be. You made it through a day of work. Now you're home. Now you want to relax and you want that me time. So that cue walking through the door are craving for the relaxation. So how do we respond to that? A lot of us, unfortunately, will maybe turn to food as that response rather than doing some forms of self-care. And again, maybe instead of like eating, which is, again, something to do if you have a hard time giving yourself a break, how we respond is really what's going to make all of the difference. So maybe it's laying on the couch for 10 minutes just to let your brain relax. But Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense going from the cue craving response reward, but ultimately that reward is what is going to drive a habit. All right, so your turn. So if you have your pen and paper, if you have that handy, uh, feel free to just jot down. So one thing that you want to start doing, or maybe it's something that you just have a hard time being more consistent with. And one thing that you want to stop doing. So really, we are going to spend the first half of the presentation just looking at building healthy habits. And then the second half will be uh, how we want to stop or habits that we want to stop doing. So if you write yours down, if you want to share, feel free to plug them in the chat box. I would love to hear some of the things that you plan to work on and we will get started. So I'll give you a moment here just to think about one habit you want to start doing and then one habit you want to stop doing. So again, feel free to share if you'd like. Don't be shy. And then we can always use those as examples as we go on here. All right, so making healthy habits. So when it comes to healthy habits, there's four laws that we're going to look at today. But before we begin, I wanted to, of course, reference Mr. James Clear from his book uh, that many people think they lack motivation when really what they lack is clarity. And this is so true. I think we leave it up to motivation a lot of times to keep us going, whether it's starting a new habit, keeping up with ones that we want to do, when really we can build systems or build strong habits that are going to take us longer than motivation itself. Because as you know, motivation ebbs, motivation flows. Some days you got it, some days you don't. But if you're creating systems in your life, that make the healthy habit the easy habit, then it is going to be a lot easier when you do run into those days where maybe you don't have as much motivation. So, so let's get into making healthy habits. So rule one of four is make it obvious. So before we get started, we have to know what your habits are. And one thing that he recommends in the book is even just making a list of all of the things that you do throughout the day. So for example, maybe it's you shut your alarm clock up, off you get up, you shower, you start the coffee pot, whatever um, that is, and then just assigning a plus or minus to it, or maybe neutral. So some of these habits, just bringing awareness to even what you're doing, because again, 50% of the time that we are running on autopilot. So uh, another cue or uh, things to help make it obvious is using habit stacking. So when you make that list of things that you're already doing, one thing that you 
do one thing that you can do is link a habit that you're already good at doing with something that you want to start. So one thing that I like to share with people is, for example, if you're a coffee drinker, uh, after I start the coffee pot in the morning, I will have eight to 16 ounces of water. So kind of linking those two together can help build a healthy habit if it's not in your routine already. Uh, another example is maybe you want to increase exercise. It looks like that is one here. So meaningful exercise. Uh, so for example, maybe it's linking that with something you already do. So if you're walking in the door after work, or maybe it's after lunch, I will put on my workout shoes and making it as simple as that. Sometimes it doesn't have to be committing to a whole like 20 minutes of exercise. It's just putting on those shoes, which will kind of take care of the rest. And lastly, for making it obvious is designing your environment. So for example, maybe you have a really hard time leading up to or after surgery, taking your supplements. One thing is, are they hidden in the cupboard? Making things obvious, bringing it out in the open, so that way uh, those easier habits are, you're initiating that cue with more visual cues. So how can you design your environment to make that healthy choice the easy choice or make it more obvious? Number two, make it attractive. So of course, when we start something new, we always want it to be attractive. And one way that you can do this is through temptation bundling. And many of you might be doing this already, but if you think of pairing an action you want to do with an action that you need to do. And the first thing that comes to mind for a lot of people is, again, when we go to exercise is maybe it's watching a show while you exercise or listening to a podcast when you're exercising. So again, pairing something you want to do, like watching your favorite TV show, listening to your favorite podcast with something that you need to do, like exercise, for example. So pairing the two of those together can be really helpful. I know one of my favorite uh, psychologists in the weight management state, uh, circles, I should say, is Glenn McIntosh. And he actually used a really interesting point of view when he talked about exercise, for example. And uh, really, we, we have so much talk about mindfulness and increasing mindfulness, whether it's eating or whether it's gratitude, whatever the case may be. But he talked about like exercise in particular was reducing mindfulness in this area. So not to the point where you're hurting yourself, but just disassociating from your body a little bit. If you find that exercise maybe is not enjoyable or maybe not dealing with the pain in the moment. So kind of being unmindful in those things and temptation bundling is one way to do that if your distraction is pulled away by some sort of media. media. And second of all, surrounding yourself with people who do what you want to do. So humans by nature want to be accepted as part of the group that's attractive to us. We want to be, we seek, we seek that acceptedness from other people. So look at who you're spending your time with now. Are the people that you spend a lot of your time with now, are they people where you want to absorb their habits? Or are they people where it takes maybe a lot of energy to try to avoid those habits. So look at who you surround yourself with because that can really fill up your energy or it can be very draining of your energy. And we, like a lot of the, the books say, we do become an average of the people that we hang out with. And so you want to surround yourself with the good people that challenge you to be your best versus those people who maybe drain your energy trying not to absorb some of their habits. Alrighty, number three, make it easy. So again, of course, like starting something new, we want to make it easy as possible. And reducing friction is one way to do that. So reducing the number of steps that it takes to do said habit. So how can you make and design your environment to make the healthy choice the easy choice? And a couple more ways to do that is mastering decisive moments. And how I like to describe decisive moments is... They are the really little things that determine how you spend the next 10, 20, 60 minutes. 
So maybe it is when your feet hit the floor in the morning, are you sliding on your slippers or are you sliding on your workout shoes? That's going to determine whether you sit on the couch for 20 minutes or you exercise for 20 minutes when you wake up. Or maybe a decisive moment is, again, when we talk about like getting home from work, is the natural reaction to pick up the TV remote or again, like maybe put on some shoes to go out and get some fresh air. So what are those little moments? So keep in mind when you're, again, kind of being mindful throughout the day of what your habits are and what some of those cues are. What are those decisive moments? So those things that will determine how your next block of time goes. And lastly, automating your habits. So what can you do to maybe make a one-time decision that makes things a lot easier down the road? And one example I like to use is using some sort of like meal service. So if you just have a hard time planning meals, maybe it's having a meal service that drops off two to three meals a week. So that way you've at least got half the work done or even automating your meal planning and being like, I'm going to set aside 20 minutes on Sundays to just plan what we're going to have for the week and map that out. So what can you do just to make those a regular part of your routine? And then lastly, make it satisfying. So of course, Again, when we start something new, we want something to keep us going. We like that reward. We like that positive reinforcement. And one way to do that is a habit tracker. So I've got a screenshot from the Life app. The habit tracker is new and absolutely love it. But these are the five things that we work on on a regular basis. So just a few minutes to yourself during the day, some sort of movement, protein, supplements, water. Not only does this go back to... Law number one, making it obvious, kind of bringing everything to the forefront, but it makes it satisfying when you can click boxes. So you can also do progress reports and track trends too. So that's why I love habit trackers. Whether you use something that's digital like this, or there are some really pretty like printable habit trackers that you can get out. And I've seen like the circle ones where you kind of get this really pretty pattern if you use different colors. But if you're kind of more artsy, that could be an option. But one benefit to using something like a habit tracker is you have that added benefit of not wanting to break the chain. So maybe you're 7, 10, 20 days into a habit and man, you don't want to break that streak. You want to keep that streak going, but it's going to be inevitable. There's going to be a day where life happens, life gets in the way and that streak may break. And the biggest thing is to not let that spiral into, you know, a week or a month of maybe getting off track. So one good rule of thumb is just to never miss twice. If you have a day where maybe you broke the chain, all right, now you got a fresh start and maybe you can break or beat that chain the next time around. So to recap, something like the habit tracker here is helpful. The green screen that you see, that is a smaller screenshot from an app called Streaks. So if you are not a Life member, you can always download the Streaks app as well. And I want to say that's like five, ten, ten dollars $10, but another alternative for tracking your habits. And that's something that you can customize. So to recap here, so building ha healthy habits, you can do that by making them obvious, making them attractive. So we talked about things like temptation bundling, making it easy, and then making it satisfying. So again, like using some sort of reinforcement, reward, something like a habit tracker. So curious uh, what, uh, if anything, you chose to do. So it looks like for building healthy habits. So one is meaningful exercise. So building muscle, not just going for a walk and getting rid of the sweets, getting rid of sweets. All right. So we've got workout and then we've got sweets. We'll use that in the next example here. So if there's one thing that sticks out, feel free to plug it in the chat box. If there is one strategy in particular, if that helps kind of put things into a little bit more concrete things, but we will be moving on to breaking bad habits. So whatever habit that you wrote down for making a healthy habit, hopefully you have one or two strategies, whether it's making it obvious, making it easy, making it satisfying. Maybe you have some more tools to help get that into your routine. 
On the other hand, for breaking bad habits, one thing that you will notice is all of the rules are going to be spun on their head a little bit. So rather than building the healthy habits, the bad habits you'll see are the inverse of the laws that we already looked at. So one example is rather than making it obvious, like we talked about making healthy habits, now how can we make that bad habit invisible? So how can we reduce exposure, remove cues when it comes to things like snacking or sweets? Maybe it is reducing exposure. I don't know if you have somebody that maybe is like a snacker in the house or removing some of those cues. And it doesn't mean removing it from the house. I know sometimes that can be a little bit of a trigger for some people is if it's completely removed, then there's that overwhelming feeling of restriction. But how can you just reduce your exposure to it? Maybe it's taking something if you've got a candy dish and just putting it in the cupboard. So you're reducing that uh, visual cue especially we're coming out of Easter. We've got Mother's Day coming up on the horizon. And why do we always want to gift people with food? I don't know. <laughs> Number two, make it unattractive. I think this one is probably one of the most tricky. And we can, you know, tell ourselves that yes, some of these not so great habits aren't attractive. Uh, but I think a lot of it comes down again to like motivation and setting up this system. So this is probably my least favorite, but if you can find a creative way to make your habit unattractive and one example from atomic, atomic habits is, um, I believe it was a person was trying to quit smoking, for example, and they were gifted a book and the author didn't write anything except how unattractive smoking was. So I, I'm not sure how long the book was but it just talked about, uh, highlighted essentially all of the bad things about smoking. So how maybe it's not as socially acceptable. You've got stinky breath, you've got this, you've got that. So by the end of reading this, the, the reader didn't even want to smoke anymore. So with no influence from, you know, getting no pressure from the doctor, I guess, by just by reading how unattractive. So that's one example, but Again, I think this can be a little bit of a trickier one. One way I like to think about it is maybe how does your, how does this habit align with your values? So for example, maybe your goal would be to, maybe it's to limit screen time if we're talking about breaking bad habits. So if you are a person that maybe values time with family and your goal is to limit screen time, maybe you can link those two together. So whenever you can bring your values into play, I think that's very, very strong and empowering. Again, when we look back to the beginning and look at that I want versus the I am statement. So I am someone who values X and that's why maybe I want to kick Z. So if you can tie those two together, that can be really helpful as far as kicking those bad habits. And three, make it difficult. So rather than making it easy as we did on the first portion, now how can we increase friction? And one way, like for example, if we're looking at things like sweets or snacking, emotional eating, I know that tends to be a big challenge for a lot of people is uh, we talked about reducing those visual cues already, but maybe increasing friction. So again, it's not that it's removing it from the house, but maybe it's putting it in an upper cupboard where maybe you're creating extra steps for yourself where you have to get out a stool or get out a chair to actually get up to those things. So you're adding steps essentially to maybe the bad habit that you want to break. Or maybe it's simply putting them in multiple containers where you have maybe something to unzip, something to, you have something, multiple layers to, to peel through that might make that a little bit more uh, obvious, but then maybe bring more attention to like, hey, do I really want this if there's multiple steps involved to getting to it? And another strategy is using a commitment advice or commitment device. And one example is this, again, I loved in the book, uh, James Clear talks about how someone was working on just kind of limiting screen time before bed or less dependence on technology. And one of the reader's commitment devices was shutting their Wi-Fi router off at like a certain time, 
So examples, say 10 p.m., the Wi-Fi cuts out, that is your sign that screen time is over and it's time to maybe read or start that wind down process. So you can have those hard stops that you plant in your life where you are going to make those bad habits more difficult. And lastly, making it unsatisfying. So how can you make your bad habit unsatisfying? And one way to do that is by getting an accountability partner, because when we have multiple eyes on us, it definitely makes things uh, unsatisfying if we let someone down. So if you have an accountability partner and, you know, ideally if you are really maybe struggling with some bad habits before or after weight loss surgery. If you have an accountability partner that's been through the process, they can make a fantastic accountability partner because guess what? They have been through it and they know maybe some of the sneaky ways that you could get around something. So if you really wanna hold yourself accountable and make it unsatisfying to let someone else down, then an accountability partner can be really helpful. Another way is to make your bad habits painful. And I think this is why a lot of things like diet bet, I believe, I think that's what it's called, where you essentially like put money down for weight loss. Or another strategy is if you have this bad habit and you really want to stop it, maybe you are putting, you know, $10 down, $20 down, where if you do said habit, that money goes to maybe a campaign that you don't like or a politician that you don't agree with. Those can be some pretty unsatisfying things that may help just to keep you on track. So a little bit of extreme, I would say, but sometimes some people prefer to do that extreme. So uh, it is what fits you best. But again, just one of the four strategies for breaking the not so great habits. So as a recap, you can take your bad habits and break them by making them invisible, making them unattractive, making it difficult. So increasing the steps or increasing friction and then making it unsatisfying. All right. So just checking in. So if you, again, are looking at maybe some of the habits that you wrote down and the habits that you wanted to make and break, what of these four that we looked at here do you think will be most helpful in doing that? So again, feel free, you can add it to the comment box if you would like, but just a little bit of food for thought. So hopefully you've kind of walked away. And one thing I want to bring to light again too is just circling back to the cue. So if you, again, are just trying to maybe step back a little bit and not be on autopilot quite so much, like noticing like, okay, first of all, what are my habits and really dialing it down to like, what is that cue? What is that, that little something, that little light bulb that, that makes you crave that reward and just maybe sinking in again to what is exactly that reward. So for example, if you uh, are struggling for sweets, what is that cue? Is it a certain emotion? that maybe kind of triggers that cue? Is it maybe somebody's house? Is it something physical or is it something emotional? What is turning on that sweet craving? And maybe looking at the reward as well, that can be helpful is, is it maybe a sense of relief, a sense of satisfaction? What is that reward? Is it really the taste of sweets or is it how you are feeling before or after you have them? So some things to maybe tease out there as you are looking through the habits that you want to make and break. And something to leave you with here is you get what you repeat. And really it's as simple as that. I think it's natural for a lot of people to ask, how long does it take to establish a habit? Whether it's building a new habit, breaking a bad one, how long does it take? Some people say 30 days, some people say 90 days, but really it comes down to frequency. So again, you get what you repeat, the more you do something, the more that that's gonna compound on your results, whether it's something you that takes you closer to your goals or takes you further away. Just look at those things that you are repeating on the daily, on the weekly, on the monthly. 
So um, questions, if you've got questions, we'll kind of gear up and see if you've got any for the Q&A here. And before we get to that, of course, you're probably expecting, here's my little, my little sales pitch, but, but no, my, um, my intention with the life program, really, if you feel like you need some extra support, or maybe it's accountability, some education, really, I support women all across their BSG journey. So before surgery, during, after surgery, and we do have a new life session that opens tomorrow. We'll get kicked off on Monday with prep week. So I always like starting with a prep week where you can get your feet wet, get used to all of the features with the app. Everything is housed in the app. So all of the recipes, your workouts, your uh, resources, grocery lists, everything that you need is there. And so that first week is just intended with getting used to some of the fundamentals. And throughout the five weeks, really, we're talking about, again, that combination of nutrition and mindset, because those two really go hand in hand and just setting you up for success down the road. So you've got an awesome ladies only community that you can tap into you have one-on-one -on -one messaging with myself as well. So you have all that and I am offering $50 off. So usually it is uh, $169 and after the $50 off, that brings it to about $120 for the five weeks. And if you're worried that, hey, five weeks, I don't know if that's enough. I've had some people repeat the fundamentals, even do a three-peat on the fundamentals. And then I do also offer a monthly membership for $35 a month after that five weeks. If you're like, hey, I need longer term support or I like this community, I wanna to continue to be plugged in there. It's not like you're cut loose after five, five weeks. So if you're feeling confident at that point, awesome. But there is the option to work with me more long-term. And you can earn money as well. So whether you join life or you don't join life, you can earn $50 for anyone who joins and mentions your name. So if you feel like you have got the support that you need, things are going great, but maybe you have a friend who is struggling, I am happy to help. And I'm also always happy to hop on a quick call just to see if it's a good fit because I know it's always nerve wracking starting something new or working with someone new. And I just want to make sure that it is a good fit both ways. So with that, um, if you aren't already, feel free to follow me. I am more active on Instagram, but always throwing out tips there. And also some on Facebook as well. Facebook doesn't always like me uh, technology wise. So I tend to be more active again on Instagram, but you can find me at either one of those places for free tips. And being that you joined this webinar, that does automatically plug you into my email newsletter too. So I'm always sending out uh, some free mindset and nutrition tips on a weekly basis. So the win the week newsletter, you'll start to see that every Monday if you haven't already. But with that, again, thank you for joining. If you have questions, uh, feel free. You can always message me at either of the platforms listed here. If you reply to any of the emails that came through with, uh, like, for example, if you're watching the replay, you can respond right to that email as well. That comes right to me. So if questions come up or you have more questions about the conversation today or working with me or life, I am happy to answer those. So otherwise, thank you so much for watching and joining. For those of you, again, that are watching the replay, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to improve you and spend some time with me. So thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day.